interested to ask briefly about the people in the audience. I'm interested to know how many of you are from academia, and how many of you are from business and industry, and how many from the law. So, anyone from any of those areas at all? Just shout it out. It's okay. A couple hands raised. Nobody's from any of those areas. Okay, perfect, good. So I can get away with saying anything and nobody will question it. Uh, so briefly, uh, the history of privacy law, which I find personally fascinating, of course, as many of you may know, is uh, started with Louis Brandeis' decision in Olmsted in uh, 1928, in which he actually dissented in that opinion. That was, Olmsted, of course, was a bootlegger, which makes the history all the more interesting. And uh, he was put away in jail after having been eavesdropped upon on his telephone by government agents. And uh, he took his, court, his case to the Supreme Court and he lost it. And they said, now government agents can listen on your phone calls and do anything else that they want. And Brandeis dissented from that opinion and said, no, the telephone is a specific invasion of privacy that uh, violates the Fourth Amendment. And why that was important is that, is that case was not overturned until 19. 67 cats versus the United States, which of course cats was a gambler. It's kind of interesting to know that the basis for privacy and smart grid and all the things we talk about are based on case law of a bootlegger, Olmsted, and a gambler, cats. But that's pretty much the way it comes out. And um, so, on the basis of these two cases, has has sprung up a body of privacy and security law that now encompasses hundreds and hundreds of laws and case precedents which have direct bearing on the smart grid today. So the, that's basically the history of the privacy laws and the framework that we look at is that there are three kind of prongs to privacy laws. The main underpinning of privacy law is not a law but of course the Constitution. And most privacy case law hinges on violations to the Constitution, namely the first, fourth, and 14th amendment 14th Amendments, and principally that being the Fourth Amendment um, against search and seizure, unlawful search and seizure. And even that greatly hinges upon um, any type of auditory invasion, communications invasion, listening, eavesdropping, because uh, over and over and over again, the Supreme Court has found that visual surveillance, viewing, and things related to uh, photography and video <coughs> are generally not considered invasions of privacy. Only auditory um, aspects are generally illegal. So the, the first of the three prongs of data, privacy law and security law, is the Constitution. The second are specific laws, and those come out of, they generally spring from the 1968 Omnibus Crime Act, which uh, was passed in response to Katz versus the United States, where Katz versus the United States said, no, uh, the United States government may not eavesdrop on its citizens. That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So in 1968, the Omnibus Crime Bill was passed that said, okay, we're going to carve out a specific exception that says that the government may eavesdrop on its citizens in the pursuit of legitimate law enforcement aims. And from that 1968 omnibus crime bill springs many of the laws and regulations today that they are on the smart grid. Because as Brent has pointed out, and as the other presenters have pointed out today, the thing about the smart grid and privacy is that people have a hard time grasping the extent to which the smart grid and smart meters can now invade people's privacy. The really cool graph, well, we think it's really cool. Uh, how does this go backwards and forwards? This one, this, we think this is really cool on our kids. But what this is basically showing is the amazing extent to which smart meters can, from minute to minute on a real-time basis, tell a story of exactly what's happening at home. And the current meters uh, you know, do not collect real-time information. And the, the increments at which they collect it are so far apart that there's no granularity in terms of knowing exactly which appliances are being used in which rooms at which times. But you know what this graph is telling you is that your privacy is now gone. Any idea that when you're in your home, people aren't going to know what you're doing every minute is gone. Anyone that is in their home is someone they don't want to be known. They don't want it to be known that someone else is in their home. They might not want people to know what they're doing. Forget it. With the smart grid, everybody knows. Every minute by minute of what you're doing in your home can now be recreated. And if you have any doubt of that, 
uh, you know, we've gone through use case after use case of situations where people are doing things in their home that they don't want people to know about, and they're easily reconstructed, and uh, you know, evidence is created that's legally admissible in any court that's being created by smart grid. This is why privacy is such a big deal. Yes. Um, I agree that, that all this is easily readily available. Um, however, one of the interesting aspects of smart grid in Japan is that people are buying battery packs now in order to opt to they actually generate enough cost savings in their from their utilization to buy battery packs to give them some energy during peak times. Um, it's very easy to see that kind of technology also being used to obfuscate this whole graph um, so that you can't tell exactly what people are using. So while privacy is a concern, um, the industry, the commercial industry, they come up with interesting ways of, of dealing with this as well as, as utilities being able to do that. So that, you know, I don't really anticipate law enforcement being able to find out as much as they want to in the long term because it's going to be too easy to come up with other ways of bypassing the system. Well, I totally agree with you that there's cottage industry springing up all over as people begin to realize the extent to which their personal comings and goings and activities are going to be known, that there are going to be ways to evade them. And it would be great to think that as uh, technology became available, that people generally went up that same learning curve and avoided it. But I think what we're going to see happen is that you know certain savvy users figure out ways to avoid it, and lots of other innocent people who don't think they're doing anything wrong, so it doesn't occur to them to take these type of measures, find themselves caught up in you know a web of law enforcement activities or civil cases. I mean, uh, civil cases provide ripe grounds for the subpoenaing of this exact type of information under discovery for all sorts of mischievous misuse and aggravation. So you don't even have to be guilty of something or do anything or do anything wrong, but you could have your life turned upside down by a legal process that's demanding discovery of all your information, which you have to disclose. So anyway, that's a very good point. Thanks for pointing that out. Let me add, add to that. It's, your, it's a good point. Um, you know, law enforcement, and this is my company, we do law enforcement compliance on the telecom side. Law enforcement
somebody and a real life case where somebody was using this data to hurt somebody else. Okay. You want this one? No. That's an excellent practical point. And one I must say that we have dwelt with at great length in our subgroup because we all are fascinated with these type of things and will dwell on them ad infinitum. <laughs> and a very practical point. Uh, am I wrong? Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, a very practical point for utilities because where does your contractual obligation and liability begin and end? And it's all about giving it all away for a coupon at Applebee's or a cup of coffee or whatever. So with respect to this particular point, it, 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 uh, that fits in perfectly to the, you know, the overall framework, as I was saying, with three prongs to privacy law, the first being constitutional uh, underpinnings, the second being specific, what we call data-specific laws, and the third being contractual um, contracts between uh, companies and individuals. 